you are tuned in to the State of Cannabis News Hour, where industry leaders, regulators, and lovers of cannabis gather collectively to move policy forward in an inclusive and sustainable way. Professionals and Canacurious alike can tune in to hear leading cannabis experts share and discuss headlines, critical industry issues, social topics, and more. The State of Cannabis News Hour, your daily dose. Hi, and welcome to the State of Cannabis News Hour, where we bring you all the top stories you need to know and talk about them for four minutes and 20 seconds. Our news is bite-sized and infused with a nice mix of facts, opinions, and a pinch of humor. It's Friday, December 31st, 2021. This is episode number 184. I'm Susan Sorries, the founder of the State of Cannabis News Hour and Conference, author of the children's book, What's Growing in Grandma's Garden, and Cannabis' Favorite Grandma, aka Nanogram. Today we're talking about car crash deaths involving cannabis spiking, the world's first carbon negative cultivation facility. Pennsylvania Supreme Court says if it smells like funk, it doesn't matter. How Oklahoma became a boom state, debt capital raises grew 806% in 2021, 12 Hispanic power players to watch in 2022, and many other frosty nuggets. So stay tuned for the full 60 minutes of the State of Cannabis News Hour. The following program contains coarse language and nudity. Viewer discretion is advised. Audience, feel free to raise your hands if you want to weigh in on a headline after it's been read, and we'll try to bring you up to the stage. Keep it brief and relevant, or you may get... Gong. Kicking off the show today is Nicole West. She's a cannabis business specialist, part-time firefighter, and director of operations at LB Atlantis. Her superpowers are overcoming obstacles and challenges with unstoppable energy. She's also an amazing daughter, friend, and cannabis activist. What's your headline for today, Nicole? Well, happy New Year's Eve, everyone. Thank you so much, Susan. And thank you for doing this. Um, It has been an amazing 2021 for us at the State of Cannabis, being able to bring this information to people. And I just want to say thank you again for bringing us all together. Um, My headline today actually comes out of Forbes magazine, which normally I don't deal with just because I feel like is a lot of advertorials, but this is actually some information that I will agree with. Um, Cannabis sales fell in 2021, but debt capital raises grew 806%. Cannabis had a blockbuster year in 2020. Sales hit record highs as people confined to their homes during COVID-19 lockdown took to cannabis to alleviate their stresses, anxieties, and boredom. With cannabis retailers deeming essential businesses during the lockdown, marijuana sales in California, Colorado, Nevada, Oregon, Washington State surged 39.2% in 2020, according to MJ Biz Daily. However, with the end of the lockdowns in 2021, marijuana retailers took a bit of a dive um, in those five states, showing that year over year total sales growth of just 15.9%, according to Headset, a, a Seattle based analytics firm. Michigan and Pennsylvania also saw a drop in their 2021 sales. This year posted a record for legislation driven marijuana legalization as markets created in five new states Alabama, Connecticut, New Mexico, New York, and Virginia. MJ Biz predicts that those five markets together will generate more than $5.1 billion in annual sales and their fourth year of operation. Still, MJ Biz says this year's numbers could be harboring what's to come of 2022. The total amount of capital raised in the cannabis market through December 20, uh, 24th of 2021 is $12. 1.7 billion with a B, ladies and gentlemen, about 1.4 billion lower than the same period in 2018, the previous year's peak. According to Verdian Capital Advisors and a New York financial and strategic advisory firm dedicated to the cannabis market. U.S. equity raises climbed 60% or $1.9 billion compared to 2018, but the debt it was where the action was. The amount of U.S. debt raised soared 806%. A lot of people are taking this on the fact that they think they're going to be able to 
uh, pan out with these debt raises, or that $3.4 billion. The amount of equity raised in Canada plunged $5.9 billion, or 76%, and debt raises fell $244 million, or 12%. The trend continued around the rest of the world as total capital raises sank and uh, equity or debt raises rose. Another trend this year, that the can cannabinoids not including CBD or cannabidiol had a breakout year. A uh, minor cannabinoid known as CBN became more available to consumers as the cannabinoid companies used new, faster methods to produce CBN products. Some CBN products combined with THC create sleep aids and THC, psych this THC the psychoactive compound in cannabis that gets one high, and CBN, the retail sales saw as much growth in 2021 that is now more than 14% of retail edible sales in the California recreational market. Super interesting information, but something that I have seen is that debt raise is getting real, real, real. And I think it's funny that Forbes decided to use a picture from Colorado 2012. But uh, with that said, I'm Nicole West reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Forbes gonna Forbes. Um, I'm curious if anyone on the stage or anyone in the audience took on uh, debt capital this year. I'm in the process of negotiating with the bank for some right now. Um, I prefer to an equity dilution right now. To me, I was very surprised that we were able to get a revolving line of credit. Um, and, you know, they, they're all in our business. Like, you know, I had to share projections and financials with them and they have like the right to review and pull the loan at any time. But it is nice having like, you know, a decent tranche of cash to work for, to work with his operating capital without having to go back for, for an actual equity raise. And I really think companies like yours, Gear, are going to do great and do fine with that kind of um, an in, uh, infusion of capital through debt. Um, a company like Papa and Barkley, you know, definitely doing the right things and focused in the right direction. I do want to caution a lot of people um, to just think that we're going to make money in weed uh, because it's weed and it's going to sell itself to take those debts because there's a lot of people that, man, I would not be taking on debts. I'd be trying to take on partners that wanted me to succeed, not hope that I failed. Yeah, fair. It's a, it's, a, it's a wise caution because, you know, yeah, we're also banking that this industry is going to rise and that we're going to be able to make that nut. We're an established company and have more assets and chance of successfully doing that. But if you were a smaller company, yeah, I would suggest that you build a community of partners rather than just having capital because capital is not what's winning the game right now. Like you have to get hearts and minds to buy your stuff in this knife fight, especially in California. I don't know about other places in the nation. And also, if you take uh, just straight debt from private, like private equity, I mean, as somebody who has worked in the space, um, nine times out of the 10, uh, if it's something that they don't fully wrap their head around, uh, but they're giving you money anyway, so they're just waiting for you to fail so that they can come and take the assets. This is a great conversation. Thank you so much, Nicole, for that headline. Uh, and thank you for commenting, Guy. We love to hear directly from the people that are in the news doing the things. But up next is Rico Lamite. He likes to ask the tough questions that the mainstream media refuses to ask. The self-proclaimed dopest dad alive is also a superstar at cracking dad jokes. Find him on TEDx or at one of his Canavision events, but always find him here every weekday as co-producer of the State of Cannabis news hour what you got for us rico ah we gotta end the year off right so forget the usual suspects 12 hispanic power players in the cannabis space to watch in 2022 this one's coming from javier Hase over at forbes and um let's go with it here in america we tend to focus on what's right in front of us the fight for legalization social equity how laws are being interpreted and enforced from each municipality up and um, those of us choosing to take a half second step back, uh, time to time viewing from a global perspective, um, or that tune into the State of Cannabis News Hour, you can get your daily dose of just that. Um, notice that the rest of the world is moving forward too, fast, without as much emotional baggage tied to racism, propaganda, and being on the ass end of America's forever war on drugs. Many global players have advanced faster than anyone would have guessed a few years ago, Javier Hase. 
um, closed the year out focusing on movers and shakers from Spanish speaking places. Ironically, many were regionally material sources for illegal product that all found its way onto our shores. As he elegantly stated, Latin America and the Spanish speaking world have always been a constant source of creativity, innovation and talent. It happens in most areas, art and bi art, business, sports, finance, politics uh, and cannabis is no exception. The uh, entrepreneurial spirit, innate ability to solve problems and adapt to changes, resilience in the face of adversity, magic of the hustle, arrogance, skein of desire. They are precisely the center of effervescence inhabitants. The inhabits the Latin DNA. Amen, brother. As an Afro Latino myself, with deep Panamanian roots, I'm proud to end the year off highlighting the top 12 picks for Hispanic rising stars to watch for in 2022. Number one, um, Matias Litvak, um, representing Israel and Argentina. He's a native Argentinian at the head of cultivation office of the Public University of Barilan uh, in the city of Ramat Gan, Israel. Uh, arguably one of the most important universities in Eurasia. Fashu Banzas from Argentina. Uh, one of the most popular and provocative content creators in Latin America with over 400,000 Twitch followers. He always finds controversial motivation in a joint, basically smoking and freestyling for hours uh, long conversation with his followers on a variety of topics. Moy Paola from Chile, influencer focused on shaking up Chilean cannabis scene through her project Santiago, uh, Santiago Verde, where she uses her skills as a filmmaker, script, uh, script writer, video director uh, to generate content for different brands. Uh, she's a medical user, uh, feminist activist, and avid poster of book recommendation, life hacks, cultivation tips, and jokes on her 100,000 plus follower IG account. Carlos Vives Junior, uh, Colombia and Puerto Rico. He, call, he now calls uh, Santa Marta, Colombia his home, um, but he's all, he is a native Puerto Rican geneticist responsible for overseeing international biotech giant Avicana's uh, commercial crop warehouses. Lilian Rueta uh, from Uruguay and Argentina. Uh, she is a river plate fashion icon, cannabis photographer, and one of the most sought after shooters in published international media. Fashu Santo Remedio uh, from Uruguay. And he's a comic storyteller, cannabis influencer, who games on Instagram, collaborates with small grow shops and often seen on TV, seen as many as welcome breath of fresh air, given the stiffness of many informative influencers of Latin descent. Um, number eight and nine are DT Beardo and El Jante, um, both from Argentina. El Jante is an Argentine music artist and biggest star of Cumbia 420, a uh, new musical style. He and his producer, DT Beardo, created his sweep in Latin America, and I can best describe it as stoner reggaeton. Um, Jante's got 2.7 million subscribers on YouTube with many videos with over 100 million views each. Uh, Di Barto says uh, the music is 100% designed for people who smoke, are from the hood, and immersed in adverse situations, but want to get out and progress. Uh, that shit bangs, too. Uh, Fashuando uh, Guerreton, he's from Uruguay and Argentina. He's an IT businessman, former congressman, uh, biotech investor, and adrenaline junkie who just a few years back ventured into medical cannabis production for Uruguay-based YVY Life Sciences and recently made waves acquiring a massive property formerly owned by a big TV sensation, Susana Jimenez, uh, turning it into a cannabis farm, Polita Pepper, uh, from Mexico. She's an activist, uh, teacher, cannabis uh, cup juror, audio visual producer, all terrain feminist, and one of the biggest names coming out of progressive Mexican legal cannabis movement. Uh, Robert de Garam uh, from Argentina, and he's a broad range YouTube influencer with 700,000 plus followers, mostly known for lifestyle, food, and cannabis content. Uh, Mariano Duque Velasco, investor and entrepreneur from Spain, founder of Asocion Club Medical, THC, and head of BSF Seeds, one of the biggest seed banks in Spanish-speaking world. Also, special honorable mention to my homegrown good friend, Dr. Sandra Carillo, repping Panama and Colombia. Yeah, she's dope as fuck, too. Make sure you guys Google her. If I say it's correct, we're going to be seeing a lot of new influential brown faces on the green scene in the double deuce. And I'm here for all that shit. Hopefully in 2023, we'll see a similar wave coming out of the African nations, too. Me llamo Federico, la mi y mi familia es de Balboa, Panama. Y yo soy, yo soy el gran padre más drogas. Reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. My grandmother is rolling in her grave right now. Happy New Year, everybody. Back to you, Susan and Nicole. 
Well, thank you so much for giving all that love to all those amazing people and companies, Rico. Um, I, we are going to jump from that. We're at time on that headline, but thank you so much. Um, and up next, we have Miss Priscilla Agoncillo. She was voted one of the top 25 women in cannabis making history and is the CEO of the award-winning Original Breeders League. What do you have for us today, Priscilla? Thanks, Nicole. Uh, so my headline is, uh, here are the biggest marijuana psychedelics and drug policy news stories of 2021. Uh, it's a really great article. Make sure you read it. It takes about 20 minutes, packed full of great info. Uh, so from full cannabis legalization in New York to the launch of a modest medical marijuana program in Alabama, Alabama, um, cannabis reform continued to spread across the U.S. in 2021, even with COVID-19 pandemic. So while federal prohibition remains in place, the year saw major movement towards reform on the federal level, including a new number of legalization bills in Congress and slow, steady progress on cannabis banking. The year also saw its share of cannabis-related disappointments, such as Congress failing to pass any meaningful cannabis reform bills and President Joe Biden's yet unfulfilled campaign pledges to stop criminalizing people over cannabis. The suspension of U.S. sprinter Shikari Richardson, uh, when she was suspended for a positive THC test, uh, kept her from competing in the Tokyo Olympics, but it also made international headlines, hopefully leading to reform by the World Doping Agency. So leading topics of 2021, legalization. Uh, for adult use in New York, retail sales aren't expected to begin until sometime in 2022. The bill's passage immediately removed penalties for possession of up to three ounces of cannabis or 24 grams of concentrates. Adults will also be able to grow cannabis at home for personal use, but that won't happen until regulators adopt rules for it, which is set to be no later than 18 months after retail sales begin. Virginia. Virginia lawmakers passed a comprehensive cannabis package in March, March which plan, with plans to legalize possession, home cultivation, and a retail cannabis market. New Mexico, uh, New Mexico capped off the spring's three-state legalization run when the policy change was signed into law. Uh, so it was listed. Uh, it was listed um, as a 2021 priority for New Mexico. Connecticut in June. Uh, they signed a bill into law to make Connecticut the fourth state to legalize cannabis for adults in 2021. The new law, uh, which began to take effect the following month, uh, allows possession for up to 1.5 ounces of cannabis. And in July of 2023, it will permit adults to cultivate cannabis at home. Alabama, uh, they adopted a bipartisan medical cannabis law that relatively it's restrictive, uh, but it requires uh, patients to be di diagnosed with one of about 20 conditions, including anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, PTSD, and any type of pain. Hopefully that leads to full uh, adult use legalization. Louisiana decriminalizes cannabis possession and adds medical flour. Uh, some other notable mentions for reform into cannabis law in 2021, the House Judiciary Committee passes federal uh, marijuana legalization bill. The drug policy debate moved forward beyond cannabis as Congress saw the first ever bill to decriminalize all drugs. Uh, California bill to legalize uh, psychedelics advances towards its final passage. And that's pretty much a wrap up of the 2021 year of cannabis. I'm really looking forward to 2022 and seeing if we can make this the dynasty of plant medicine. I know we can do this. So happy new year to all. I hope you all get high as fuck to bring in 2022. This is Priscilla signing off for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Oh my God, Priscilla, that was perfect. I'm going to use that as a, a wrap up of the year in our, our newsletter. Um, I have been hesitant to say forever. I haven't, these words have not come out of my mouth yet, uh, but is the genie out of the bottle? You can't put the genie back in? Are we at that point? Hell yeah, we are. Toothpaste can't go back in. I I haven't said it yet because, you know, crazy so long, shit happens. But so what, long as the schedule or bust, um, the genie could get fucking smashed into a bunch of pieces and turned into somebody that can't grant wishes if we're not careful. That's I like to say. Keep working. Oh, I think if they try to put that genie back in the bottle, the people are going to revolt. They're, they're, I think people have had just about enough. I just like what is. I, Go, Jason. I, I just like to say when when it comes to those things that there's too much sand to shovel it all back into the ocean. 
I just want to point out once again that New York State has 11 people incarcerated for cannabis possession. And if that isn't one of the big headlines of 2021, I don't know. Yeah. All right. Let's keep smoking the news. All right. He's known as some as Kaiser Brose, and he's now a bi-coastal snowbird, splitting time between West Hollywood and his new winter home in Mar-a-Lago. The industry's longest continuous running retailer doesn't drink bubbly, so my guess is tonight he'll be ringing in the new year, sipping on his favorite beverage, Liberal Tears, and of course, out of non-recyclable packaging. What you got for us this morning? Jason Zett. Oh, yes. Good morning, Rico. Um, Today, I have uh, another final countdown of uh, legislation, and this is the normals top 10 events in marijuana policy. So starting off at number 10, we have the U.S. Senate punts on an opportunity to advance safe banking. Members of the U.S. Senate failed to include House passed safe banking provisions as part of the 2021 version of the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, Number nine, we have twin studies rebutes claim that early onset cannabis use increases psychosis risk. Uh, Cannabis exposure during adolescence is not independently attributed to either adult onset psychosis or signs of schizophrenia, according to longitudinal data from two cohorts of twins published in the Journal of, of Abnormal Psychology. Number eight, Unregulated Delta-8 THC products, often mislabeled, may contain impurities. Labeling information provided on the packaging of gray market Delta-8 THC products is typically inaccurate, according to independent analysis of unregulated over-the-counter products. Number seven, courts strike down marijuana legalization votes. The Supreme Court of Mississippi and South Dakota issued rulings this year nullifying voters' decisions to legalize cannabis. Number six, Rates of youth marijuana use decline. Fewer young people are consuming cannabis, according to data compiled by the U.S. National Institute of Health and published in November. Number five, historic percentages of Americans say cannabis should be legalized. The percentage of Americans who believe that the use of marijuana should be legal held record highs in 2021. Number four, marijuana arrests decline per per, per, person. The number of persons arrested in the United States for violating marijuana laws declined 36 percent between 2019 and 2020, according to data released in September by the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation. Number three, lawmakers enact workplace protections for cannabis consumers. Policymakers at the state and local level adopted numerous laws in 2021, limiting employers' ability to either fire or refuse to hire employees solely based on upon their off-the-job cannabis use. Number two, state officials vaccinate over 2 million cannabis convictions, or excuse me, vacate over 2 million cannabis convictions. Officials in multiple states have moved to either expunge or seal the records of over 2 million people with cannabis convictions. And coming in at number one, I feel like David Letterman on The Tonight Show right now, we have five more states enact adult use legalization laws. Legislature in five states, Connecticut, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, and Virginia enacted laws in 2021 legalizing adult use cannabis possession and regulating retail cannabis markets. And I will tell you what, I'm wishing everyone the best 2020-22, regardless if you had a good year or a bad year in 2021. I wish nothing but love and prosperity for you coming greater in 2022. And this is Jason Beck reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. What else? Was the vaccine a Freudian slip there, Jason? You think it's a good thing? That's what I was thinking. You know, there, there's been so much vaccine talk and whatnot. My mind just went on autopilot when it saw that word. It must have been those private debates you had with um, the former president down in Mar-a-Lago, huh? I mean, I mean, vacate vaccine, write it out, look at it. I mean, they they, they both Isn't look really he similar. Isn't Trump like a huge vaccine proponent now? You know, his accomplishment. Big, are we bigly, are, are, bigly? Are we believing things that Trump says now? Is that, is that, is that oh. what, what's hot in the street? Oh, Victoria's well, been red pilled. Not so bigly. Well, that has been a fun conversation. 
so much for all those amazing headlines. Mr. Beck, uh, Waiguchi, I'll see you in 2022. Uh, and up next, we have Miss Victoria Littman. Victoria is a graduate tax scholar at Georgetown Law, focusing on cannabis and psychedelics. She's also our very own taxivist. What do you have for us today, Victoria? Hello. My headline today comes out of Montana from the local NBC affiliate KTVH. And the headline is, Recreational marijuana launch doesn't apply to all Montana counties. So recreational or adult use, as we like to say, cannabis passed in Montana in November 2020, and sales begin tomorrow, January 1st, 2022. Uh, but as the headline suggests, sales won't begin in all counties. As part of the negotiations over the adult use uh, bill during their 2020 legislative session, lawmakers inserted a provision into House Bill 701, which linked adult use sales to whether the county voters supported the initiative, uh, again, which passed in 2020. In counties where most voters backed the legislation, recreational adult use sales would be automatically allowed on day one. Counties where a majority of voters rejected the measure have to hold an additional public vote to opt in to allow sales. So about half of Montana's 56 counties voted a uh, majority in favor of the initiative and the other half voted against it. So, but just the way demographics are, the 28, what they're calling green counties, as in voted in favor, included over 80% of the state's population. Um, Beaverhead County had the closest results in the state with the no winning by a difference of just 27 votes. Uh, business owners unsurprisingly, are disappointed by the county-based restrictions, arguing they're just likely to drive customers to neighboring counties or to the uh, illicit market. Since marijuana position won't be illegal statewide, people could just drive back and forth into the red counties um, with cannabis they bought elsewhere. Counties are able to flip from red to green or vice versa. So a resident in a red county, red being no, not politically red, can circulate a petition. And if they get enough signatures, they can hold another vote, which uh, on, on whether they will allow the sales. In a green county, leaders can also call a vote on whether they want to prohibit the businesses. Um, so they can't really go against the the people, can't go against it. Dawson County was the first red county to switch. Last week, they held a special election where voters approved the sales, and the county commissioner expects that that will change uh, the change will take effect on January 1st. Uh, in Yellowstone County, which is a green county, county commissioners decided to place a vote on the June primary ballot, which gives residents the option to prohibit sales. Uh, so it's like a swinging back and forth between all these counties. And just a little additional background I pulled from some other sources, Montana voters first approved medical marijuana in 2004, um, and the market then morphed into what they call the Wild West, with little to no regulation from the health department. In 2011, lawmakers, which were responding to federal raids across the state, passed a law that restricted providers to three patients um, and really ended access to products for 93% of patients. The state Supreme Court upheld that law in 2016, but the voters later overturned it with another initiative. And since then, the state has developed more rules through their Department of Public Health and Human Services. In the vote in November 2020, the voters changed the overseer of the industry from the Department of Health to the Department of Revenue. And the initiative set July 1st, last July 1st, as the deadline to transfer the program, the medical program, which was under the health department, to the revenue. So this really expedited deadline created a pressure cooker environment. And the department just finalized its last package of rules two weeks ago on December 22nd. And again, sales start tomorrow. So we're going to probably see more movement in the regs and rules as it rolls out. Um, and I was happy to bring this news as someone who thinks Montana is a really beautiful place whose beauty is only made greater by smoking some really good flour. And Montana also has a huge meth and opioid addiction problem. So I think creating more access there is a great thing. I also think this approach of holding counties to the initial vote of the initiative in terms of sales on day one, to the most part, I mean, I guess a, a few counties were able to hold votes before day one. But for the most part, it's however you voted, that's what you get on day one. Um, so I think that's really interesting. Unlike what we're seeing in New York, where the localities have way more time to opt out before sales start, doing it this Montana way is allowing the program to be up and running incredibly soon. By comparison, New York passed in late March 2021, four months after Montana, and is not set to open for adult use sales for at least another year. So although one was done legislatively and one was a ballot initiative, I still don't think that the timelines should be so different. So I like the speed of Montana, but I could also see how this negatively impacts business owners and counties where there wasn't full support at the time the initiative passed, and they can't start sales tomorrow. So I'm, of course, also curious about the tax implications of this. Um, but I'd be interested in other correspondents or anyone in the audience uh, perspective on this approach. Do we think it's fair to only allow sales on day one in counties where a majority voted in favor? Are there other states who have done it this way? Um, I'd love to hear from you. And uh, I'm Victoria Littman with the State of Cannabis News Hour, and wishing everyone a really happy new year. 
Yeah, just briefly, Massachusetts did it that same crazy way, and you have to do a second vote to opt in or out, and meh, it's been annoying. The the whole voter initiative is, um, the alternative has been something that's been a battle in a couple places that I've worked in. Uh, the city of Long Beach actually did voter initiative for their medical um, and not for their adult use, and so there's things within the medical that count, uh, contradict the adult use regulations, but in order to change the ballot initiative of medical we'd have to have another vote and nobody's wanting to do that so the city's just kind of blindly looking at the the new laws and being like yeah we understand that the old laws contradict this but we're just going to go with this new stuff instead um and so there's some things that i think with the having them roll out two totally separate ways has been negatively impacting certain communities as well I, I I do like how they how they did that county uh, by county, and so if you're in a green county or a red county, based off your voter count on the initiative, um, if California would have done that, we, I'm sure we would have a lot more greener cities. We've reached the, the half hour mark. I'm going to relight the room. You are tuned in to the State of Cannabis News Hour, your daily dose. The thoughts and opinions expressed in the State of Cannabis News Hour are those of the individual speakers, not those of any other speaker in the State of Cannabis or its members. The statements made in the State of Cannabis News Hour do not constitute legal or accounting advice, and the State of Cannabis and its speakers make no representation regarding the legal status of any substance in any country, area, or territory of any other authorities. The views expressed in this room do not establish any fiduciary relationships. The sponsorship of the State of Cannabis News Hour do not imply or constitute any endorsement by the State of Cannabis or the expressions of any of the opinions whatsoever on the part of the State of Cannabis or any of its speakers. Viewer discretion advised. Let's keep smoking the news. If phone booths still existed and you saw smoke coming out the top, don't snitch. That's just the State of Cannabis News Hour's very own Clark Kent getting higher than a bird or plane ever could be. He's a communication strategist and publisher of the American Cannabis Report. Up next, we've got Christopher Smith. What you got for us today, my brother? Oh, my God, Rico. That was fantastic. Uh, good morning, Susan. Good morning, Nicole uh, and everyone. My headline is from Health Europa because you can't get you can't go too far for a good cannabis story. Uh, but first, I'd like to share some good news on the last day of the year uh, for a consulting project I was working on last year and this year. I had to become well versed as I could on regenerative practices and carbon sequestration stuff like that. So. I took a course from the Carbon Literacy Project in Manchester, England, which was recognized by the United Nations as one of the top um, 100 transformative action programs that could materially change the way we deal with climate change. And just yesterday, I learned that I am certified as carbon literate. And now that I have passed the audition, I can tell you about my headline, which is the world's first carbon negative medical cannabis cultivation facility which is being planned in the UK of all places. A leading infrastructure investment firm has agreed to invest 22 and a half million pounds in glass farms, farms with a PH, very cute, um, which is the, the largest dedicated infrastructure investment in the UK medical cannabis industry to date, demonstrating real confidence that medical cannabis has long-term and sustainable future in the UK. The facility will be two and a half hectares or six acres of indoor grow that will be powered by an anaerobic digestion plant which converts food waste into electricity with hot water from the plant being utilized for both heating and cooling in the greenhouse. So kudos to the Brits for investing in an advanced facility, I think, for the uh, cannabis industry, and hopefully some of their technologies can be leveraged in indoor environments worldwide. A bit of a disconnect, though, when they talk about their confidence in long-term medical cannabis in the UK. Although they do have GB Pharmaceutical making Epidiolex, the cannabis-derived drug that costs about $32,000 a year and requires sick children to take grams per day of CBD isolate, not milligrams, but whole grams, um, but more importantly, medicinal cannabis was legalized in the UK in 2018, four years ago tomorrow. And do you remember how many patients are approved to get their cannabis medicine through the National Institute of Health? That number is three. Three people in the whole country of 67 million. Law-abiding parents with sick children have to pay almost 3,000 pounds a month to either smuggle cannabis or import it. And UK government authorities have literally taken medicine out of the hands of mothers with epileptic children. And uh, as a, uh, another point of view, California legalized medicinal cannabis a quarter century ago. So if the UK says it wants to be serious about medical cannabis, they need to put up or shut up. A second, this Glass Farms group is showing a roadmap of how a pharma company thinks about cannabis. Their announced aim in this press release that I reviewed is to secure the first UK commercial license to supply high THC cannabis flower 
to lawful third parties, such as pharmaceutical companies, while creating a secure supply chain of replicable end product by employing an array of methods, including AI-based environmental management systems to control a range of growing variables. That's exhausting. Um, sounds like a recipe for British boof uh, to me. And they say that they want to start serving customers in 2022, but they haven't even broken ground yet. And as Nicole West so ably explained the other day, even after they finish construction, they will have at least four to five and maybe more growing cycles before they've dialed in their environment and processes and can deliver this replicable end product they're looking for. So cannabis patients in the UK will have to keep a stiff upper lip until then. And I want to wish you all a happy new year and stay safe out there. Back to you guys. I'd like to call bullshit on this being the world's first carbon negative medical cannabis cultivation facility. Um, in California, we had carbon negative medical cannabis cultivation facilities for more than a quarter century. It's called outdoor cultivation because outdoor cultivation takes carbon and puts it in the ground. Thank you, Omar. Thank great. you. Thank you. Great, great point, Omar. Great point. If no one else wants to comment, let's keep smoking the news. All right. Well, thank you so much for that uh, story, Christopher. And also, thanks for uh, quoting me on uh, the other day's news. And up next, we have Anna Mead. Anna Mead is a technical and legal writer and the author of A Big Sister's Guide to Cannabis. And also our very own Captain Planet. Earth, air, water. What kind of fire are you bringing today, Anna? Well, thank you, Nicole, for that great introduction. I'm coming to you high. Well, high times, anyway. Australia capital cannabis legalization support has doubled in six years. According to a new research report, changes in the cor and, and correlates in the Australian public attitudes toward illicit drug use, published by the Drug and Alcohol Review, attitudes towards cannabis have rather dramatically shifted in Australia. The National Drug St Strategy Survey is surveys about 20,000 people in a random sampling, and they found that support for cannabis grew from 25% in 2013 to 41% in 2019, and support for legalizing other forms of drugs like cocaine and ecstasy also rose dramatically, but not quite so much. However, support for legalization of heroin did not change noticeably. It found it's generally unaffected by age except... Uh, those older than 50, and men are more supportive than women, as are university graduates. Um, employment status is pretty much unrelated. Uh, finally, the number of people supporting punishment for small amounts of personal use has continued to drop. What does this mean? Well, the su significant findings are really no surprise. While support for legalization of other illicit drugs also was found to have increased, it's part of a generational response to the war. Uh, to the war on drugs. Um, support across generations is also consistent with studies elsewhere, despite Boonemer's reputation as the generation which rediscovered cannabis. Uh, it's undeniable the impact of reform in North America has impacted the discussion about cannabis reform elsewhere, uh, since the U.S. tends to lead. However, um, what happens next is very much in the air, particularly now. Just as of last December, the last national German poll on the topic showed that under 50% of Germans uh, supported legalization, and as of this year, full boat legalization is high on the agenda of the new political co coalition. So given the fact that cannabis reform generally in Australia has been influenced by or tracked German developments, this could mean as early as next year the issue could be brought up again on a national level here too. Last year, the cannabis legalization um, policy political party was formed in Queensland. This year, a territory uh, effort in Victoria was squashed in August, and it has been heated up there for the last several years, gaining more steam, unsurprisingly on the national level, as medical reform has progressed. Uh, one thing is also undeniably clear, the period of this study has taken place, the importance of other English-speaking global digital pro-cannabis media. 
the fact that Germany will become the largest industrialized country to legalize recreational or adult use as soon as potentially this next year, at least legislatively, will also make an impact. Starting with the fact that Deutschland is already of interest to those in Australia in the medical industry seeking to sell to this market. No matter what, in other words, the Aussies appear now to be on the brink of greater reform. And like New Zealand, which also narrowly defeated recreational reform last year in the general election by just over two points, not to mention in other countries, steady as she goes at this point means the majorities in most democratic Western nation will be in the four column within the next couple of years. I'm excited about this. I want to go smoke weed everywhere in the world, especially in Australia. What do my other correspondents have to say? I wonder if any of this, of these statistics in Australia can be attributed to the fact that they're, maybe they're possibly locking up non-cannabis supporters in their COVID camps in Australia. Whoa. <laughs> oh my God, Jason. What? I just don't even know how to respond down that rabbit hole. Well, I will yeah. say uh, <laughs> Was that it? Currently, it's like a $2,000 fine in Australia uh, for weed. And like, that's always sketched me out. So that's something uh, worth noting because they, uh, if you get up to commercial level, it's like a $200,000 fine in jail time. So just changing that, I think, is going to be a huge movement. I'm hopeful, very hopeful for Australia. I smoked a lot of weed in Australia. I had a great time. I've been wanting to go to the Nimbin Cannabis Festival, and I think Nimbin, Australia is going to be the Humboldt and Mendocino of Australia. I am thinking back to when I, so when I smoked hash in Afghanistan, of course, I was with a bunch of Kiwis and Australians, and I don't know, man, I think they can hang, so let's see. So serious. They're wild in Australia. It's wild yes. out there. I've always yes, thought they are. I'm strict about the Kiwis invented they are. bungee jumping. Because they are so fun. I think you're all broken up, Nicole. All right, so up next, he's known and respected by industry peers as an outspoken defender of the culture and perpetual bridger of gaps. He's hands down one of my favorite OGs in the game and co-founder and president of Papa and Barkley. Our next correspondent can teach y'all all a thing or two about going from legacy to legal and not losing your soul in the process. Giro Court, what you got for us today, my man? Thank you, Rico. Thanks for that introduction. Good morning, Nicole. Good morning, Susan. Oh, ready for 2022, y'all. Um, so this is coming out of the North Bay Business Journal. It is entitled, Looking Back, Cannabis Industry Gets Fired Up Over Taxation. Um, from cultivators to producers, distributors, retailers, companies rallied when California Department of Tax and Fee Administration announced in December it would raise the taxes growers pay because of rising inflation. The state cultivation tax is due to increase from $9.65 to $10.08 per dry weighted ounce next year. You know, I always deal in pounds just for, rec just for you know, accuracy. That's about 160 bucks a pound or more than 10% of the dry value at a wholesale level. It's not, it's just untenable is what it is. Um, in, in the almost the same breath, the state also announced $31 billion surplus in its budget. This coincided with cannabis dealers who witnessed market prices dip often three times less than a few years ago. So it, it's pretty clear that we're contributing tax revenue, but yet even when people warn that uh, taxes, like high taxes, price decline, and illegal market would lead to a market collapse. It does seem that that's what we're being pushed to. This quasi revolt started with one supplier pledging to hold back taxes. Local governments, such as Mendocino, Sonoma counties, promising to support and sympathize. And Senator California Senator Mike McGuire from Hellsburg proposing a bill to shift the amount growers pay to the excise tax has culminated in a letter sent to the governor and state legislator. State legislator. The petition asked for the removal of the cultivation tax and a three-year holiday on the excise tax paid at checkouts, as well as an expansion of retailers to sell the glut of product that the market, in a market which no longer companies, I'm sorry, in a market, glut of product on the market in which larger companies have squeezed the small farmers. This all comes back down to 
uh, in a in in a in a industry after 25 years of medical use and a pandemic and you know dispensaries becoming uh, essential categories, we still have this notion that somehow we need to over uh, tax cannabis. Latham Woodward, CEO of uh, Sense Distribution in Santa Rosa, says the industry's trials lack of uh, the industry's trials to a lack of understanding. He says, quote, I find this most offensive. Woodward singled out the lack of access to banking service and governments taxing us to oblivions as acceptables. We are being treated unequally under the law. This would not be tolerated for one minute in the wine business or one minute in the beer business. Woodward said calling 2021 the year of reflection for an industry witnessing, t- witnessing, witnessing tax revolts and a call to arms and a consolidation within the supply chain. This also coupled with what we see outside the state, while the federal government tried to get something done, and we all now know they didn't, we saw conservative states like South Dakota and Oklahoma really start to boom. We now have three dozen states that the voters at the ballot box have approved legal cannabis for adult use, and yet our federal government continues to lag behind. And one of the things quoted in the article is that Agrich California could sell a multitude of these products, sun-grown products, to Omar's point, over the over the its borders if the feds would ever get out of the way. In any case, you guys, this is you know not new news to us. This taxation is beyond crazy. I think Economics 101 states that when you lower the tax burden, the industry grows and all ships rise. If legislators really wanted to just make money for Sacramento, they would lower the tax rate and grow our industry. This is clearly cannabis shame at play. It's the same shit we've been dealing with. Love to know what everybody thinks. I'm Guy Rocourt reporting for the State of Cannabis New- uh, News Hour. It's we a full-time a jack t- move, man. Yeah, we have a couple of towns in uh, Massachusetts who are now uh, eliminating local taxes on cannabis. Yeah, the the cultivation tax has to go. It's just totally ridiculous. The excise tax needs to be lowered to to a much more marginal rate and just based off off a flat uh, flat thing, not the actual perceived retail value. They also should not be taxing cultivators based on a volume or a weight of a product. They should be ta- taxing it based on the sale amount, not if they are going to tax a cultivator. It should not be the same rate for somebody who's selling one product at $3,200 a pound versus somebody else who's selling it at 300 And there's literally that big of a fucking gap in growers in the state of California. So when you're looking at 154 up to $200 um, per pound in tax, Taxes on this. When you're selling a pound for three hundred dollars, you really, really breaking down the math of realizing they're making a hundred buck. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly right. And you know, I also fear that some of the super grows cited, uh, you know, the ones that we all know in Lake County, Santa Barbara, Salinas, like these mega grows that are cited in the article. These folks are taking not our capital, not legacy capital, but somebody else's capital to placehold and squeeze small, fa- squeeze f- small farmers out. Because at scale, you can deal with a hundred bucks a pound. When you're only making a couple of pounds on a few acres that you've been deemed okay to grow, well, then things get really hard. And that's where the inequality really happens. It's almost like the game is rigged for big suppliers to placehold. And then finally, when the taxes are lowered, they'll be the only people standing. And that's that seems what we're driving to. And it's so obvious obvious and it's very frustrating. Almost like I think you are a hundred percent uh Guy. It is just like that, where they are holding the space for those the haves and trying to keep out the have nots on a regular basis. Um fucking America. Thank you so much for that headline, Guy. Um and up next we have Omar Figueroa. Omar is the founder of the boutique law firm focusing on transactional cannabis law, the director of the National Cannabis Industry Association, a legal publisher and author, the Gangier or cannabis sommelier, and a practitioner of high-style Brazilian jiu-jitsu. What do you have for us today, Omar? Happy New Year's Eve, my people. My story is from Pittsburgh City Paper by Ryan Dato, and the headline is Pennsylvania Supreme Court says warrantless searches not justified by cannabis smell alone. On Wednesday, Pennsylvania's highest court confirmed a decision by a trial court that said the smell of cannabis cannot be the sole basis of a warrantless search by police officers. The state Supreme Court said law enforcement can use the smell of marijuana as part of the justification for a search, 
but it can't be the only reason. The decision smell stemmed from an <laughs> incident in 2018 in which a driver in Allentown was pulled over after Pennsylvania state super troopers observed a minor traffic violation, failing to stop at a solid white line before an overpass. Then a trooper smelled the odor of burnt marijuana through the open window of the vehicle, wrote Chief Justice Max Baer in the majority opinion. Police then searched the vehicle and found a plastic bag with less than one gram of cannabis next to the front center console with no markings that would have indicated it was purchased from a medical cannabis dispensary. Medical cannabis is legal in Pennsylvania, but not recreational cannabis. This search by police was deemed unconstitutional by a trial court based it was solely on the smell of cannabis. The evidence the police procured could not be used in the trial, and the small amount of cannabis charge was dismissed. That ruling was upheld by the state Supreme Court. We reiterate that the record supports the trial court's conclusion that the troopers searched the car in question based solely on the odor of marijuana coming from it, wrote Baer in the majority opinion. We further hold that the odor of marijuana alone does not amount to probable cause to conduct a warrantless search of a vehicle, but rather may be considered as a factor in examining the totality of the circumstances. The prosecutors, the Lehigh County District Attorney in this case, had argued unsuccessfully that the smell of cannabis, quote, has not lost its incriminating smell by virtue of its legality for some, end quote, referencing the state's medical cannabis law. That argument was rejected by the Supreme Court justices. A few justices filed a dissenting opinion, writing, notwithstanding the legalization of medical marijuana for cannabis patients, there are still several ways in which the smell of marijuana can combine with other factors to supply probable cause for a search. One is that an officer who smells marijuana may also discover evidence of a violation of the Pennsylvania medical cannabis law which, in turn, may establish probable cause to believe a crime has been committed. So for, from my perspective, as long as cannabis remains illegal under some circumstances, don't leave your cannabis in plain view on the center console. That's just basic 101. Also, don't smoke in the vehicle because that's where the odor of burnt marijuana comes from. Get out and take a little rest break and smoke outside your vehicle. And... The headline is Pennsylvania Supreme Court says warrantless search is not justified by cannabis smell alone. This is Omar Figueroa, lawyer, author, and Ganjia instructor reporting from sunny Sonoma County for the State of Cannabis News Hour. So, Omar, you're saying that um, brands shouldn't be selling uh, things to uh, ash their joints out in their cars? Well, you know, if they're trying to set up their customers for a bust, I guess that's a good way to you know, to reverse market. Yeah, hey, I'm just saying. Well, but one of the big problems that a lot of people have is they don't have an authorized consumption space, and then that becomes their parked their car, whether or not it's parked or moving, and that is the only consum legal consumption place a lot of people have. Um, and I would never condone anything like driving and smoking. But, you know, a, a box of uh, an old empty box of uh, Marlboros on the dash is, always goes unnoticed. But if you're I, I that's so true. driving I, and smoking, though, I know it's like a taboo thing, but they've had research come out that says it, it's not always an influence. And for some people who are meditating, it might be helpful and make them better drivers. Like, I think cell phones are worse than we. I agree. I, agree. I, I think I think smoking cannabis actually prevents road rage. Yeah, Hot box so thing is begging for a DUI. Let's keep smoking the news. Let's go. Let's go. We got a couple left. All right. So up next, this highly informed retired combat documentary journalist and mindset coach is working at the intersection of cannabis education and human performance optimization. After choosing to no longer work for Uncle Sam, she now works for all of you. By amplifying unheard voices in the cannabis community. Sean Salvaje, what kind of news are you smoking on this morning? You guys, I'm smoking some really good news today because I'm very, very high, uh, which is interesting because I'm in Texas. Uh, how 
Did Oklahoma become a marijuana boom state? That's the headline I'm bringing for you today. It comes to you from the New York Times. It is behind a paywall. If you have a subscription, please read it. It's beautifully written. Uh, I miss the days. I'm not going to say the Times is the best at journalistic standards, but I really just miss very good writing. And this is done nicely. Um, across Oklahoma, a staunchly conservative state with a history of drawing people in search of wealth from the land, a new crop is taking over old chicken coops, trailer parks, and fields where cattle used to graze. Next door to a Pentecostal church in the tiny town of Kyoto, the smell of marijuana drifts through the air at the GNC dispensary. Strains with names like OG Kush and Maui Waui go for $3 a gram, about the quarter of a price in other states. And we are in Oklahoma, a place where there are more dispensaries than grocery stores now. This is bizarre. If you would have asked me, a little neighbor from Texas, you know, a few miles over if o- that Oklahoma was going to be a completely green state in back when I was growing up in the 90s. No way. I never saw this coming. But, you know, it's fueled by low barriers to enter. And by the way, that was the New York Times is writing everything that was beautiful and well done. Please read this article. It, it is really nicely written. But um, so what they're saying is that Oklahoma is this big boom state because of low barriers to entry, which most of us in the industry already understand and know. It costs only twenty five hundred to get started compared to one hundred thousand or more and across the state line in Arkansas. Um, And and even more in states like California and New York, right? Uh, So we're seeing a lot of -of out-of-state operators in Oklahoma. And it's making uh, the traditional legacy operators, the old school ranchers, folks (laughs) that I know here in Texas, a little leery uh, because ranchers, farmers, sheriffs, and crop dusters are joining forces to call for a moratorium on new licenses. This is due to climbing prices for land, illicit farms, strains on water, because Oklahoma, it's not known for its water, y'all, and electricity among the reasons. Uh, So what we have here in Oklahoma, because I want to give people time to comment since we're talking about Oklahoma and it's a hot state. What we have in Oklahoma is this unique explosion in the state that historically has been very underserved, rather poor, and lacked resources to to do something a little big on its own. And now we've got this big green rush happening. uh, And there are going to be some repercussions from that and some changes because some of the locals are benefiting, but many are being left behind. Uh, while MSOs and even illicit operators from California and New York are looking to find out how they can broker their deals in this Oklahoma. Um, it's just an interesting time to be up there in the Wild West. And I'd just really like to hear where you guys think Oklahoma is going to go for 2022. This is Sean for the State of Cannabis. Please read this article. Well done. And an interesting little dive into the OK State. I'm going to go ahead and jump in because I want to get this article in and we're about out of time Um, because tonight is famous for drinking and driving and we all need to have uh, uh, some things to say because we are, we have, we're important voices. This article comes from Forbes magazine and the headline is car crash deaths involving cannabis spiked alcohol often used too. And we've been talking about cross-fading. So uh, both the percentage of car crash deaths involving cannabis and the percentage involving cannabis and alcohol combined more than doubled in the U.S. between 2000 and 2018. And people who died in crashes involving cannabis had 50% greater odds of also having alcohol in their system. Researchers said that while the proportion of crash deaths involving alcohol has remained constant over the last two decades, the proportion of crash deaths involving other substances, especially cannabis, has increased. For the study, researchers analyzed 19 years of data from the uh, Fatality Analysis Reporting System, a national database of fatal crashes on public roads. Cannabis was found to be a risk factor for alcohol co-involvement, even at levels below the legal limit. But Marlene Lira, an epidemiologist at Boston Medical Center and lead author on this study, said that testing methods for cannabis are problematic as people can test positive for cannabis weeks after consumption. However, we can say that fatalities from crashes involving cannabis are more likely to have also involved alcohol, even if we don't know the exact levels of cannabis. 
Most cannabis tests do not distinguish between past use and acute intoxication, the study noted, and implementing standard thresholds is challenging because of tolerance from regular use. So please, please read this article. Have it uh, ready to go when people want to talk to you about uh, crash deaths. Um, but I, and unless anyone has anything burning that they want to say in this last episode of the State of Cannabis News Hour, um, I'm going to wrap this show, wrap this year. Thank you so much, Correspondents. It, it's just been truly an honor to work with this team this year. Uh, you guys work so hard to uh, inform our audience, inform the public. I really appreciate being a part of this team, and um, Rico and Nicole, thank you so much. Um, really, we've made something special. An audience, thank you for making the State of Cannabis News Hour the stickiest show here on Clubhouse. Susan, why drink and drive when you can smoke and fly? Yes. You've more than into the more than two thousand stories, y'all. We collectively move policy forward in a more burger place. Way. Start your Happy morning with Rhino. Join us every weekday at nine a.m. Pacific time for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Happy New Year, everyone! Your daily dose. Happy, Happy New Year, everybody! New Year. Be safe out there. Goodbye. Say goodbye. Yeah, there we go. Do it again, Rico. Goodbye.